Open your Bible with me this morning, the book of Luke, chapter 12. Luke, chapter 12. Uh, Kind of, uh, remember Paul Harvey used to do uh, the rest of the story, those of you that remember uh, Paul Harvey. Uh, This morning, I'm going to do the middle of the story. How's that? The story within the story. Uh, Luke, chapter 12 uh, begins, uh, Christ has a crowd. Uh, this was still at the height of his um, uh, popularity, uh, and there is a huge crowd uh, that's following him, so much uh, that they're kind of uh, trampling on each other, pushing and shoving to, uh, to get up uh, around, them, uh, around him. And uh, Christ, if you, if you read chapter 12, the opening verses, um, you'll, you'll find it's kind of a, uh, a heavy uh, theological uh, lesson. Christ is uh, dealing with some of the, the major um, hot button issues of, of his time. Uh, he uh, spent some time there uh, and, uh, in, in talking about uh, warning against hypocrisy. Uh, and uh, that's not just a hot button, I guess, in his time, but uh, he spent some time uh, to begin with talking about, uh, about hypocrisy. He talks about um, God's judgment. And uh, th- those are kind of the, the things that uh, he's talking about. Hell, God's wisdom, um, you know, some, some of those issues, the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and all those are, uh, you know, any one of those things could probably be a, uh, a year or two's class in, uh, in, in seminary. Uh, and, and he's uh, teaching on those things uh, when all of a sudden uh, he is um, interrupted. I don't know if you've ever uh, been around somebody, had uh, an acquaintance like that, that, um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're talking, uh, you know, uh, down this path, and they'll interrupt you and go that direction. Uh, you know, uh, I, I know a guy that works for uh, the state convention that's a lot uh, that way. You just, uh, you can be talking about something, and all of a sudden he's allowed to yell out, doorknob, uh, you know, I, you know, just, uh, you know, what, kind of whatever, uh, you know, whatever, you know, one of those, whatever pops into his mind will very shortly uh, find its way uh, across his tongue. Well, that's where we pick up in this story uh, in verse 13. One of those guys uh, is in the crowd. So I'm going to ask you to, uh, to stand with me, and, and let's read this. I, I think you need to see uh, the background, uh, or that's the background of the story. Um, and, and now in verse 13, uh, we'll begin picking up uh, with where this guy uh, shows up and jumps in. Uh, and he jumps up and he says in verse 13, One of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Right in the middle of this discussion on the uh, wisdom of God, uh, hypocrisy, um, that kind of thing. And, and all of us who are parents can kind of identify with this. You ever had, your, if you've got more than one child, you ever had one of them say, Tell him, give me back my toy. You with me? That's what we got here. Uh, one guy jumps up in the middle of Jesus' lesson and says, Tell my brother to give me my money. Uh, and, and so that, that's what happens. Jesus responds this way. Who made me a judge or divider over you? And then Jesus does what he's so good at doing. He takes and just straight to the heart of the matter. Uh, This man's worried about his inheritance. Look what Jesus says. Take heed, beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body that what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are you better than the fowls? And which of you taking thought can add to his stature one cubit. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for an opportunity again to stand and preach your word. God, I ask you to, uh, to, to preach through me. 
God, to uh, allow me this morning to, to say every word uh, that uh, you'd have said, and God, nothing else. Uh, God, that uh, your will would be done, your purpose would be accomplished here in our midst today. For it's in Jesus' lovely name I pray. Amen. We started three weeks ago on a series I've called Empty. Uh, we talked about empty tombs and empty lives. Uh, this morning we're going to speak on something that uh, we're maybe a little more familiar with, and that's empty pockets. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we know that in our culture, uh, in our society today, uh, that uh, debt and credit and finances are a, uh, are a huge, huge issue. Uh, many people uh, will go uh, this fall to the ballot box, and their ballot uh, will, be ba- uh, will be strictly based uh, on, on finances. Uh, you remember, uh, you know, Kennedy said years ago, uh, to ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Uh, somewhere along the way, we've thrown that in the trash. Uh, that has nothing to do. Uh, you know, we have uh, folks who strictly uh, will choose their candidate uh, based on the promises of what it means for them personally, not uh, anything about uh, the nation. We have uh, politicians who that's all they're worried about is what uh, is in it for them uh, themselves. And so this morning, uh, I want us to look at this passage and uh, and tackle this topic uh, that I know makes many Baptists squeamish, uh, and that's the issue of stewardship. Uh, because when I say stewardship, uh, some of you automatically uh, assume I am about to preach uh, on tithing. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't even know if tithing came up at the first service, did it, Arch? I, I don't think I did. Uh, stewardship is so much more uh, than tithings. The word, uh, the idea of being a steward, simply means uh, that we are managers. We are uh, we are managers of those things uh, that God has placed um, in our hands, and so. We we are uh, managers, not just of our tithe, but we are stewards of our family. We are stewards uh, of our abilities. We are stewards at work. We are stewards um, of our possessions. We are, uh, we are much more uh, than just a tithe. And so this morning, uh, as we look at this story, uh, it's important, I think, to back up and, uh, and to get a little bit of an understanding of what, uh, what drove uh, this man to stand up uh, and uh, ask Christ to intervene, uh, ask Jesus to intervene in his, uh, in his family uh, squabble to step in and, and take care of uh, this, uh, this disagreement uh, that he was having uh, with his brother. So we begin by, uh, by looking at uh, the interruption, the request this man had. Uh, the man stands up and uh, it's a little bit um, out, of, out of character for us because it's really not the, the way that uh, they that inheritance and, uh, and, and wills operate um, in our, our world today. Uh, uh, for the most part, with, within certain measures, a man uh, can sit down and he can take his will. Um, and, and Archie, for example, could write down uh, in his will that he wanted, uh, you know, a uh, dollar to go to Tabitha and a dollar to go to James and the rest to go to the grandkids, which wouldn't be real surprising. Uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, some of the other grandparents I noticed looked up and said, hey, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, you know, uh, that's, uh, you know, but, but you kind of have that, uh, you know, you kind of have that option that if you want to, uh, you know, you can leave it over here to the Salvation Army or, you know, to your church or, you know, you can kind of write your will more or less, uh, again, within certain legal restrictions, pretty much um, as you please. But in their culture, it was a little bit different. Uh, it was uh, somewhat, um, you know, kind of a, a, basically an automatic setting uh, for, uh, for an inheritance. When a man uh, died, his children divided his property equally. And, and the way they would do that was a little bit interesting. Uh, as you probably know about their culture, the oldest son uh, was uh, what would be entitled to a double share. And by that, just to give you a, a mathematical example, uh, for example, a man with four children uh, would uh, have, say he had $10,000. And when he would die, they wouldn't divide the money up $2,500 apiece. What they would do is they would divide that 10000 Instead of four ways, they would divide it five ways. And so a share then would be worth 2000 And each one of the younger children, the three younger children, would get 2000 apiece. And the oldest child would get a double share or he would get 4000 And so that was just kind of a, a, a standard um, inheritance, a standard uh, practice uh, in, 
in this, uh, in this situation. And most likely what was going on in this particular situation is uh, that the older, this is probably, it's probably not the, the younger brother here uh, who, who is, uh, is complaining. It's in all likelihood, it's probably the older brother who is actually complaining. Um, and, and in all likelihood, what, what some believe about this story, uh, and it, it may not be, but uh, because we don't know who, we don't know how much, we just know uh, that somebody is complaining uh, about the inheritance. Uh, that uh, many believe that it was probably the older brother who was complaining, who didn't even want to give the younger brothers their share, that he was wanting to keep it all. And, and so he had went to Christ and said, Lord, I tell him, I'll give me the money. You know, I, I, I want it all. And, and so very quickly when, when we read that, um, you know, again, that, that's not something that, you know, in our culture today uh, is, is all that uncommon. We hear uh, of families fighting and bickering uh, over, you know, over the inheritance all the time. We, you know, it's a common uh, occurrence. I've, uh, if you're like me, I've watched families bicker and fight uh, over stuff that I'd have been mad at them if they had put it in my car. You know, I wouldn't have took it home with me and they fighting to get it. You know, uh, but they, they, you know, families will bicker and fight. You've seen that. Maybe you've been there uh, over just trivial junk. You know, uh, many times what really makes it bad is not only is it trivial junk they're fighting over, even when it's good stuff, they don't need it. You know, it, it's not like they're going to starve without it. You know, it, it's not like they're going to go hungry uh, if they don't get it. But you know, what, what is the word? We, uh, there, there's a word for that. What do we call that? Greed. There you go. Uh, you know, very simply. Uh, and so that's what we see uh, happening in him. Uh, and, and Jesus uses the word to jump ahead. We know what Jesus is going to say. Jesus is going to look at the man and say, don't covet. You know, the biblical word is coveting. And coveting is a really interesting sin. Coveting is a, is a, is a really curious sin. Covetness, somebody has said this uh, about covetness, said covetness uh, cancels all bonds and brotherhood. Covenant cancels all bonds and brotherhood, makes wrong right, uh, and, and cares nothing for father or brother. If you've ever seen an inheritance fight play out, you know that that is the absolute truth. It doesn't care anything for bonds. It doesn't care you know, uh, what kind of agreements have been made. It doesn't care who said what. I want it. I want it. It doesn't care if it's their brother, their father. It doesn't matter. They will trample their mother to get that little picture off the wall. Yeah, it, it, it will get ridiculous uh, sometimes. And, and, and that's what covetousness does. Covetousness will cause a man to, uh, to stab someone in the back for a job, for a promotion, not even a raise, just because I want that office. You know, I, I want that office. I want, you know, that's a better office. It's got a better view than mine does. And they will stab people in the back. Coveting uh, will, will, is basically, when you get down to it, the root uh, of sin. And so when we look at this, we see here his request. Lord, give me, tell him to give me that money. Tell him that. Why, why do we say that? Again, the reason, very simple. Covetousness, greed is driving uh, this man. Think about this. This man had reached the point of total desperation. This man has the opportunity that day to walk up and to address Jesus Christ. Now, I don't think he fully understood, as we do, who Christ is. But I'm sure that he had heard a story of, of, of Jesus. You remember some of the things Jesus did? Jesus has, let a, has told the deaf man you can hear again. He's told the blind man you can see again. He's told the mute man you can speak again. He's told the crippled man you can walk again. He's told the dead man you can live again. And all this guy can think of when he meets Christ is tell my brother to give me my money. Think about that. Let that soak in a minute. That's what covetousness and greed does. It became, it became the driving factor in this man's life. Now, I, I, I don't know how far, how deep the tentacles may reach in, in your life, but I know that pretty much everybody in here, and, and it doesn't matter age, you take a little tiny child and set him in the sandbox, and he will take... 
and bash another kid in the head over a little toy. You don't have to be real old for covetousness to strike. But some of you have seen that. Some of you have experienced that. You've been on the receiving end, and if you've been honest, you've been on the giving end. When you get your eye, when you get your mind on something of this world, whether it's money, whether it's fame, whether it's fortune, whether it's a girl, whether it's a boy, it doesn't matter. It will drive you nuts. It will come to the place where it consumes you, just like this man. An opportunity to talk to the creator, the sustainer of the universe. The man, the very one, the Son of God, who had life and death in his hand, and all he can think of to say to this man is, Tell my brother to give me my money. Actually, tell my brother to give me his money. Greed, covetousness had overrun him. And and, and that just, this revelation, it just flies right along. It matches exactly where we are in America. I heard heard someone uh, four years ago, uh, on the television, they put the microphone in front of this lady's face, and, and she declared who she was voting for. Excuse me, probably eight years ago, who they put a mi- vote, microphone in her face, and she said who she was voting for because if he got in, he was going to start paying their power bill. May not be who you thought either, so don't be jumping the gun on which party or who you thought that was. We have folks all over the place, again, who are consumed with covetousness. And and, and many Christians who are consumed with with their problems, thinking that that the problem is, and and the truth of the matter is, most of the time, that's not even the real problem. It's not really what's going on. It's symptoms. It's much like going to the doctor and saying, my doctor, my arm hurts. And he said, well, take an aspirin, when the truth of the matter is, he didn't x-ray, he doesn't know that there's a broke bone. There's a cast involved. There needs to be a cast involved. You know, so many times we get caught up in the problems without looking and realizing that the problem is that the Bible tells us we walk by faith, not by sight. We're not being good managers, good stewards of what God has given us, like this man. Now, that kind of sets the background of what's going on in, in this story, but let, let, let's talk about the insight. What, what does Jesus say to this man? Jesus says to him, first of all, he gives him, a, again, a statement that is a little bit, if you think about it, a little bit odd. I'm not the judge. I'm not the divider. You would think maybe Jesus would say, well, how much money are we talking about? Where's your brother? What happened? You know, is there a will? You know, let, let's be honest. Think about it. If somebody came to you and said, my brother's... Yeah, maybe not to you, but let's say somebody goes to court and and, and files a lawsuit and and, and says, my brother's trying to rip me off out of my inheritance. What's going to happen? They're going to bring in the will. They're going to bring in witnesses. They're going to want to see bank account information. I mean, they're going to want some information, right? The judge is going to want to know, you know, what are you nuts talking about? Have you tried to settle this on your own? You know, there are going to be a lot of questions asked. <laughs> Not Jesus. Jesus says, who made me the divider? You know what Jesus is basically saying to this man? Jesus is saying, you're all in a tizzy over something that doesn't really matter. you are all been out of shape over something that, that, that didn't really matter. He wanted, God, Christ wanted him to know, I'm not your referee. You know, I, I, I'm not the referee. He, he says, he, and then he really kind of, laser focus that Jesus has, he, he, he goes on from, 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 from his words to this warning. Look what he says. He says, take heed and beware of covetousness. I don't know. Man might have had a legitimate case. I don't know. Do you? I don't know how much money we're talking about. I don't know how many brothers we're talking I don't know anything about this story. All I know is Christ looks at him and just zeroes in, just has a way of cutting all the fluff off the story and getting right to the, to the heart of the matter. And says, take heed. Beware of covetousness. Beware of greed, he says. 
Beware uh, 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 of this attitude that you've got. This man's real problem here, you know, let, let's think about it. You, you know what had happened. You, you know what was going on without even knowing their names, without knowing who was involved. You know that these brothers, that these two brothers were now angry with each other. Would you agree? Obviously. But not only were the brothers angry with each other, I can just about tell you that this brother was angry with this brother's wife. Or in that day, wives. Wives. This brother was not only not speaking to his brother or his sister-in-law or laws, he wasn't speaking to his nieces and his nephews. Am I right? You know I am. There's a good chance he was angry with his cousins because probably some of the cousins took that brother's side. Am I right? There's a really good chance this man was mad at his brother's neighbors because he thought they took his side. Am I right? There's a good chance this brother was mad at people who didn't know anything about it. Am I right? There's a good chance this was even causing some friction between this brother and his wife. Right? Probably a fairly decent chance that it was causing some friction between this man and his boss at work. Right? Did I lose you somewhere in the story? Probably a really good chance that it was causing friction. It was probably in all likelihood affecting every relationship this brother had. What do you think? To some measure. And Jesus looks at him and says, you know what? The problem is not your brother. The problem is not your brother's wife. The problem is not your brother's kids. The problem is not your brother's neighbor. The problem is not your father who didn't write the will up the way you think he should. The problem is not your wife or your kids. The problem is not the lawyers. The problem is not the judge. The problem is not the court system. The problem is not the banker. The problem, my friend, is your greed. I will guarantee you that is not the answer that man was looking for when he said, Hey! Tell my brother to give me my money. But Jesus cuts and says, beware of covetousness. Listen, we can covet a lot of things. It doesn't have to be money. You know, one of the things I've noticed, some of the greediest people in the world are some of the poorest people in the world. You don't have to have a lot of money to be greedy. You don't even have to be greedy for money. I know people that are greedy for fame. I know people that are greedy for a job. I know people that are greedy for a position. It seems to me that some people are greedy for another man's wife or wives. It, it, it seems like, that, that, that according to the Bible, you can even be greedy and covet spiritual things. The Bible says, there's a story in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8, a man who was greedy, who coveted the gifts that others had because he wanted to use them. He wanted them for, for personal gain. We can be coveting. We can be greedy of a lot of things. But look at the wisdom that Jesus says here when He says, But we are not our stuff. Those of you that knew Ruth Whittington know she hated the word stuff. She didn't like for me to use the word stuff. But you know what? I don't care what she liked. Because there's not a better word to describe what most of the stuff we got is unless it's the word junk. Stuff. I've done a lot of funerals. Been at a lot of funerals. And folks, I've never been to one and never done to one where they said, you know what makes this man really great? Because he was a multi-millionaire. I've never been to one where they said this man ain't worth killing because he didn't have but two dollars. No, I can tell you just the opposite. I've been to some where they had to take up a collection to pay for the man's funeral. And people stood and said what a great man or a great woman that was. 
What a great life she lived. And I've been to some where that person had more stuff, more junk than they could divide up. And people didn't show up because they knew they wasn't worth killing. I don't guess there's no use in killing them at that point, was it? Jesus says a man is not his stuff. We have come to that place in our culture, in our society, even in the church, where we look and we think that a man is his stuff. Jerry Reed, some of y'all, Jerry Reed sang back in the 70s a song called Lord Mr. Ford. In that song, he said, we have come to the place where we've decided we measure a man by the kind of car he can afford to drive. One of the wealthiest men I knew took his baths in the lake behind my house whenever it was warm enough. One of the wealthiest men I knew didn't have a telephone. We cut his power off in the spring because he didn't need it and go to bed when the sun went down. When that man died, I forgot how many million he left to the Salvation Army. Some speculate that there's money buried out in the woods behind where his house used to be. I don't think so. I think he was too greedy because it didn't draw interest. I'm not saying there was none, but uh, I don't think there was much. He might have had a little stack. You know what your stuff is. Because Jesus says we are just stewards. You know, there's a difference in being a manager and being an owner. Some of you, you own your business. Most of us were just employees, maybe had the privilege of being the manager. Or I don't know if you call that a privilege all the time. Of course, some of you are the owner and you wish you was just a manager sometimes. You could be like Martin and work with your wife and be the owner, but just not even be the manager, you know. (laughs) Just be an employee. There's a difference in being the owner and being the manager. And one thing you better learn real quick is if you're a manager, there's a big, big difference in being the owner and being the manager. When you're the manager, you're just managing somebody else's stuff. And somebody else is going to come along, and one day they're going to manage it, and you're going to be gone. We're just managers, is what Christ is trying to get across here. He's going to start, and He's going to tell us a story. He's going to tell this man a story. You know the parable. We read it. The parable says there was a man who had all kinds of stuff. His farm, his garden, everything was just... No pun intended, coming up roses. That man looked around one day and said, Man, things are going so good, I'm going to tear down my barns, I'm going to build bigger barns, tomorrow I'm going to grow more stuff, and I'm going to put it up, and I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry, and I'm going to live a life of luxury. Beware. This very night, your soul is required of you. You don't own anything. You're just a manager. You're just handling other people's stuff. Look at this story, this illustration. Jesus tells stories, parables, because this is an interesting story, because it doesn't matter what culture you read it in or what language you read it in, everybody understands exactly what he's telling, why he gives us this story. Look at the point. Jesus says, beware of success. Not that success is bad. I've told you before, I pray every one of you are successful. I pray you win all kind, get all kinds of money, win it, earn it, however you get it. I don't, well, other than steal it. You know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I hope everybody's successful. That'd tickle me. You know, as long as you don't take it from me, I'm good. You know, I, that's, you know, I hope we're all successful. I hope I come in next Sunday and all of you are sitting crooked because your billfold's so big. I, you know, that'd be wonderful. And not credit cards, cash. And not ones, twenties, you know. But he says to beware of success. Listen, this man got to the point where he said, you know what? He, he said, I, 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 I don't, if you look at this passage, I don't see God. All I see is me and my stuff. One of my favorite stories is, is and, and, and I'm not going to do it justice because it's a little longer than, than I, I want to tell, uh, but, but of, the, of the man who takes his son to McDonald's, 
and buys him a, a, a pack of fries, and, and, and they sit down at the table, and you know everybody gets all bent out of shape worrying about whether their kid's going to say mama or daddy first, when reality is, what's the first word most kids learn? Mine. Yeah. Mine. You know, they're a year old and don't own nothing and walk around talking about mine. Yeah. You realize I can take that and everything else you got? Ain't nothing yours. Mine? His father buys his son some french fries and they sit on the table and he reaches across to going to get a fry and the boy grabs his fries and says, Mine! Daddy says, I thought, man, do you not understand that I'm big enough? I, I, I bought those fries for you. I'm the one that provided those fries. I'm big enough that if I choose, I can take every one of those fries from you. Furthermore, if I choose, I can go get more fries and bury you in fries. Man. Who do we think we are going through this life saying, man? Our Heavenly Father sitting on the throne going, who do you think you are? Do you realize I could reach across the table and take everything from you in one swoop? Ask Job. Do you realize I provided the stuff that you're calling mine? Do you realize that if I choose to, I can bury you in stuff? He owns the cattle of the hills, he says. Who do we think we are getting caught up in our success? I could stand here today and name for you, name after name. Some of you, you know them. I, I, I may have to jump around a little bit to find the right age, the right bracket. I, I could mention the name Chubby Checker. How many of you know Chubby Checker? How many of you know what he's famous for? One song. No, I take that back. He sang less twist. And then he sang Let's Twist again. One song. Popular for a while, and then he was gone. There's all kinds of entertainers and artists who had one song, and they were famous for a while, and then boom, they're gone, and the newest fad comes along. Who do we think we are? We're just stewards. We're just managers. I can't tithe. Yes, why not? It's not yours. I can't share. I can't help my brother. I can't give anything. It's mine. That's the mindset most Americans have. It's mine. Do you understand that what's yours, your children and grandchildren are going to squander and waste? Don't be putting too many claims on it. Do you understand that what you were running around so hard trying to hoard up, the revenueers are coming. <laughs> Friday, in fact. The revenueers is coming. <laughs> you and Granny better get your shotgun. The revenueers is coming. Beware of success. It's fleeting. It's for a moment. I heard about the preacher who visited a Texas farmer. And the farmer said, come up here, I want you to see something. And he took him up in the barn, and he walked to one end of the barn. He said, as far as you see in that direction, I own it. And he walked down to the other end of the barn. And he said, as far as you can see in that direction, I own it. Took him over, and as far as you can see in that direction, I own it. As far as you can see in that direction, I own it. Why do you think of that, preacher? Preacher says, that's very impressive. i got one question. What do you own in that direction? Beware of success. Beware of self-assurance. This man says in these next verses, if you count them up, 13 times this man uses personal pronouns, I or me. Never a word about God. Never a word about God. We're just managers, stewards again. We're not owners. We don't have anything. David Dry. Love David. David was a good man. David used to say, 
You say you own your house, you're fooling yourself. You're just a renter. You're just a renter. You may have the deed, you may have made all the payments, but you're just a renter. Try not paying your property tax for a few years and see what happens. You're just a renter. I've stood in hospital rooms, I've stood at hospice, and I've watched people who, to quote George Ounce from the cathedral, said one time, I know I've got a lot more days behind me than I have in front of me. Who they realized that and they knew that. And the greatest, you, 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 when you talk to them, the greatest fear, the greatest concern they had was that they were losing their grip on those things they thought they owned. Those things they thought they had. I can't tell you how many times I've stood in hospital rooms at Hospice House and watched the vultures gathered outside the door. Some of them didn't even have the decency to gather outside the door. Gathered right in the room, dividing up mama's stuff, dividing up daddy's stuff. We don't own anything. We don't have this whole idea of I've got it all figured out. You know what? There's somebody right now at Wilkinson's, at Hartzell's, at Ladies, at Whitley's, at Clark's, at every one of them. There's somebody right there right now who wasn't planning on being there today. Many times I go down the road, and I don't know what you think when you pass a funeral procession on the road. Many times I pass a funeral procession, and it, this is the thought that runs through my mind. I don't even really think so much about who's in the hearse or anything. The first thing I think, I look at the family. or You, know, some, you don't even see really the family car anymore, but the car's right behind. You know that's the family, and I, I think about them and you know, try to, try to you know, say a little prayer for them and for their comfort and you know, for their situation. But then many times a thought goes through my mind. There's not a person in that line from the hearse all the way back who thought they'd be in that line today. If you look at their date book, if you look at their calendar, that wasn't what they had laid down for today. Many of them had to take a day off work. Many of them had to travel. Many of them had to make many arrangements because that wasn't their plan. This man had a plan. Jesus says, don't trust in that barn. Don't trust in that food. Don't trust in that stuff you think you have. Don't trust in those things. Go home today, today, pick up that obituary. You pick up your paper and you look down and, and those guys, those men and women that are there, they weren't planning on being there today. Beware of self-assurance. Beware of self-security. Very closely related. This man said, this will I do. I'll do this. I'll do that. Many people go through life thinking their stuff. Look what he says at the end. I will take ease and I will eat, drink, and be merry. Many people think the more stuff I get, the happier I'll be. You know what? This is my observation. It seems to me that many people, the more stuff they get, the more miserable they become. That's been my, I'm not saying everybody. Listen, I'm not saying, you know, money make you happy. I'd like to try, you know. It, um, you know, um, but a lot of people think if I can just get, to this point, if I can just get my, I, I, I remember working for a guy who I remember what his goal um, was in his retirement account. You know, he thought, man, if I get it there, that's it. That's it. If I can just get this, if I can just get that. A lot of our young people, I, I know this morning that a lot of you in here that have some years and some some, some of the tread wore off the tires. You've kind of learned this by experience. Some of you young folks under 30, 35 in, on down, maybe a little old, 40 or so. Some of you are working like maniacs. Some of you are trying to gather. Some of you are trying. And listen, good. I'm glad you work. I wish more people would follow your model. But I can tell you, there's an old, I don't know why I'm in the old song business. How many of you remember the old song, Bony Fingers? Remember the words of that song? Work your fingers to the bone. What do you get? Bony fingers. 
Stuff will never make you happy. Stuff will never make you happy. Never, ever make you happy. Beware of self-security, thinking that your stuff is going to satisfy you. And then finally, beware of self-satisfaction. Listen, he says, Soul, thou hast much goods. I've got it all figured out. I've got it all done now. I own it. It's mine. We're just managers. We're not owners. There's not a thing in this world you own. You might be handling it right now. You might be in possession of it right now. But much of what you had, or much of what you have just a few years ago was in someone else's hands. And in just a few years will be in someone else's. Empty tomb, empty lives, empty lives lead to empty pockets. You can have everything. Many men think their measurement is based on their checking account statement. Men, especially men, I believe, think that the more we got, the better off we are. The better father we are. The better husband we are. I've told you this before. I'm not meaning this to pile on it's just a simple fact my mother will tell you my father would walk in from work and the first thing he would do is cut on that channel that runs to stock market across the bottom of the television and pretty much nothing else mattered till bedtime but what the stock market and his stock did that day I've told you I'm not trying to pile on it's just a simple fact I never went to school a day in my life with tore up clothes unless I tore them up. I never went to school hungry, as you might imagine. Never went to bed hungry. If I did, it was my fault. Because it wasn't, wasn't because there wasn't groceries in the cabinet. But I've told you this. I was somewhere in the range of 32, 33 years old. Had been to the county jail to get my daddy out for drunk driving he stood on the back porch and in all those years 30 I guess I was about 30 he stood on the back porch and he said your mother tells you I don't love you but that's not true and that's the closest and the only time in my life that my father ever came to saying I love you did he have stuff yeah had to call the auctioneer to get rid of it but stuff doesn't make you a man. Stuff doesn't make you godly. You can die with empty pockets and be a happy, blessed man. And you can die with a bank account running over and be most miserable. It all comes down to your relationship with God. And realizing, I'm just a manager. I'm just a steward. Not just of my money, but of my life. I'm not just the manager of my finances. I'm the steward of my family, of this church, of my, any talent that I have, any skills that I have. Every bit of that is on loan from God. How can I give to the church? Because it's not mine. I made the statement at 8.30. I'll make it with her sitting here. Anybody, anytime who wants to know what your pastor gives to this church, Carol, you have my permission. Print it out and give it to them. I don't care. I've told you before, if you don't remember, mine's set up from the bank. It comes to the church every week. If I die tomorrow, I don't know if Rhonda knows how to stop it. We'll be given 20 years after I'm dead. How can you give? You know, 
I'm, I, I don't mean to pick on him, but I'll get off arch. Tommy over here, he said it last Saturday at our men's breakfast, I don't have the gift of mercy and grace. Y'all ever heard him say that? Any of y'all ever heard him say that? He's full of baloney. Tommy is the most graceful, merciful person I know. He's a big old porcupine. He likes to cover it up. If you know anything about Tommy, you know he gives and gives and gives and gives. Now, I'm, again, there's others like that. He just said, and I, Tommy would probably fuss at me when church is over for telling this. But you know why he's that way? Because I believe with all my heart, Tommy knows he don't own nothing. He's just a steward. He's just a manager. It's not his. Folks, we need to look around us and see there's hurting, hungry, broken people all around us. And we have the time, the talent, the ability, the resources. The poorest person in this church is ahead of 90-some percent of the world. The average salary in China is right around $1,000 a year. We've been stewards. We're managers in the greatest country in the world. What are we doing with it? What are we doing with our life? What are we doing with our resources? I want to ask you to bow your head as our musicians come. And I want to invite you this morning to this altar for two purposes. Everyone in this room needs to take a moment and kneel and say, Lord, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for what you've trusted me with. I realize this morning I'm not an owner, but God, you have blessed me. As the Bible says, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, that I'm not even able to contain it. Most of us don't even know what all we own and what all we have. How many of us have said at some point in time in our life, Oh, I got one of them. I don't know where it is, though. We got so much stuff. We don't even know where our stuff is. If you've ever moved and had to pack everything up, you realize just how much stuff you got. God, I want to thank you for your blessings on me. For all you've given me. Some of us need to kneel at this altar and say, God, make me a better manager. God, help me to realize I'm not an owner. I'm just a manager. Help me to realize life doesn't consist of what I, what I gather, but what I give. You may need to be a better manager in your home or your own life. Maybe of your stuff. Maybe of your talents. You've got a talent you're not using for God. God, make me a better steward. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I promise you, you're not doing everything you can or should with your life. If you're here today and you don't know God as your Savior, you need to come. Let us show you from God's Word. Today is the day you realize I'm just a steward. I'm just passing through. Life is temporary. And I need to know Christ as we stand together. Thank you.